Beauty, beauty, beauty. The beauty of flowers, the beauty of their stems, their leaves, their petals, the beauty of this one next to that one beside this other one next to still another. The unasked for, undeserved, abundant beauty of flowers. The physical incarnation of grace. Not wine into blood, not bread into body, but the true gift of what is given without metaphorical or theological transubstantiation from earth and sky, soil and sun to each member of the great family of all souls. If you are new to Unitarian Universalism or new to this congregation, you might not know that we, like many other Unitarian Universalist communities, celebrate the beginning and ending of the summer season with two distinctive rituals, the flower celebration and the water celebration. In it, the flower celebration is a unique ceremony in which we give and receive the gift of a beautiful flower. It's followed in late August by another opportunity to come and bring waters together that we then mingle in the sanctuary. The mixing of the water symbolizes the way in which we have come together in community. These two celebrations are expressions of how Unitarian Universalists understand the sacred and the nature of religious community. Flowers and water are ordinary, necessary, and astonishing. They are ordinary in the truest sense of the word. They belong to the regular order of things. As this morning's rains might have reminded you, it's almost impossible to pass a day without encountering water. It is ubiquitous. It makes up the mass of our body, covers the bulk of our planet. Flowers, too, are everywhere. Sure, we might not notice them all the time, but even a trip to the grocery store will reveal, matured into the fruits we eat, the fractured white buds from vines transmuted to grapes, before the apple, the blossom. And that artichoke, well, it itself is a flower. They bloom so that we might eat them. Much of the year, they bloom for their own fecund purpose, sparking the seed that carries one generation to the next. But flowers and water are not just ordinary, they are necessary. We cannot exist without them. Water sustains us, is us. Flowers feed us. Without these two things, there is no bread. The loaf begins in wheat's flour, and there is no wine. The elements of the Christian communion rely upon human industry for their existence. Ours do not. They are precursor, an expression of our understanding that any particular religion is somehow connected to the universal. Each culture will have its own fruit of the vine, make its own bread, but all necessitate water and flour for their genesis. Ordinary, necessary, astonishing. Ever present as they are, there is something awe-inspiring about water and flowers. Listen to a rainstorm. Hear terrestrial music as the drops drum the ground. Gaze at petals, each scent of lemon blossom with its soft hint of jasmine. 
and find yourself reminded again of the beauty that is the earth. Ordinary, necessary, astonishing. We Unitarian Universalists understand that revelation is not sealed. Each and every moment, each and every object, each and every flower contains the possibility of some new truth or fresh experience. It's like our great sage Ralph Waldo Emerson said, you too can have an original relation to the universe. That relationship can be found in this flower or that, this vase of water or that. This leads us to proclaim what James Luther Adams named the prophethood of all believers. While many of our congregations have ministers, there is no requirement that a Unitarian Universalist community be led by clergy. Ministers are not understood to have any special relationship to the divine that is unavailable to the laity. Instead, it is hoped that the act of preaching, which Emerson defined as life passed through the fire of thought, might offer you something that is of use. The reverse is true. I am constantly experiencing new revelations, discovering new ways of understanding and coming to new truths through my relationship with you. Sometimes this happens through the practice of dialogue and discussion that is such a habit within our community. In my conversations with you about the eighth principle, to offer one example, I have deepened my own thinking about the work of dismantling white supremacy and other kinds of oppression. It means one thing I've learned to make a commitment to anti-racism up in the north and another to make one here in the south, in the neo-confederate south. Here we find ourselves beset with the question of living our faith in the face of the politics of cruelty. How can we act, we are called to ask, to dismantle oppressions which, which the cruel whom govern the state are so assaulting so many of us with? LGBTQ communities, particularly those whose members are transgender, are targeted. The white controlled state government is wresting power and resources from black and brown red, lead cities like Houston. The governor has a bill on his desk that will strip local elected officials of the ability to set labor standards, ensure civil rights, protect the vulnerable and address the climate crisis. It is very different here to make a commitment to the work of collective liberation than it is in California or Massachusetts. There are other teachers though besides words. Only a couple of weeks ago a member of the congregation brought us such a lesson in flowers. Maybe you were not here, maybe you did not notice, but recently we had a most unusual arrangement, garden flowers. Well, not garden flowers exactly. Good garden things organized into a bouquet. Arugula going to seed, kale, mustards, red chard with its ruby red veins, and purple spiked chive flowers. To me, it was a subtle reminder of the many things that can be woven into beauty. It prompted me to look a little bit differently at my own garden. Perhaps the bean blossoms or corn husks should be reimagined. Blossoms, bouquets, we're holding our flower celebration as the rains arrive, the heat and humidity oppressively return and Texas commits ever further to cruelty. In such a season of discontent, it must be recalled that the flower celebration is not just an expression of our 
Unitarian Universalist commitment to democracy, a commitment we will reaffirm this afternoon during our annual meeting when we collectively make a decision about making a statement of shared values. It is also a celebration of anti-fascism. Now that is a much maligned word in today's discourse, anti-fascism. But anti-fascist was what Norbert Chapek, the originator of the Flower Communion was. And he conceived the service along those lines. The year after Mussolini came to power, the same year that Nazis launched their failed Bush, beer hall push, he thought of a ritual that would express a commitment to building a society where each and every human being's beauty was celebrated. And that is a core commitment of both that political tradition and our Unitarian Universalist faith. Everyone is beautiful in their own way. Just as every flower offers beauty, each person, no matter sexual orientation, religious belief, gender expression, race, age, or economic class, contains beauty as well. Chopek celebrated his first flower communion on June 4th, 1923. It helped him build the Unitarian Church in Prague to one of the largest of our tradition. Before the Nazis invaded Czechoslovakia, more than 3,000 people would gather with him to observe it and make a religious commitment to democracy and ritually honor the beauty of each and every person and the gathered community. When the Nazis took power in Prague, they decided that Chapek was too dangerous for the Reich to allow him to live. And so he was murdered in Dachau. But not before he held one last flower celebration in the death camp. There he gathered with his fellow prisoners flowers found amongst the weeds, among beauty amid the horror, and offered a testimony to the power of beauty to endure. Today, at the start of Pride Month, when almost everyone, the LGBTQ community, women, people of color, political dissenters, can find themselves under attack, it is an important testimony to remember. And cherry blossoms, a camellia falls, or clouds on the mountain ridge, blossoms at dusk. I break a scented blossom and see the white. Who can be grim in the face of such abundance? There is nothing to compare. No need for beauty to compete. Beauty, the prophethood of all believers, revelation is not sealed. This morning, this hundredth anniversary of the flower celebration, let us give thanks for Chapek's vision of a democratic religious communion. Let us give thanks for his vision of our faith. But more than that, let us give thanks for the beauty within and around us. It is found in flowers, yes, but it is also found within you and within you and within you and within you and all who gather together to commit to build a more beautiful world. May that beauty grow ever stronger and more present amongst us. And may the congregation say, Amen.